and build up what we call and will continue to call herd immunity. This is the saner approach, the more moral approach, the more scientifically based approach. Hello and welcome. You're watching Lockdown TV from Unheard. Uh, so as the eyes of the world have been on the United States and on the health of President Trump, uh, three prominent scientists for this past weekend have been meeting in a house in Massachusetts to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic more broadly. Um, and they have come together to produce a declaration um, which sets out an alternative approach to how this virus should be tackled. Um, they are Dr. Martin Kuldorf from Harvard, Dr. Sunetra Gupta from the University of Oxford, and Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford. I am delighted that the three of them join me now from Great Barrington, Massachusetts, where they've been meeting all weekend. So perhaps if we just start with, with you, Dr. Kuldorf, what are you what are you doing and, and why are you there? Uh, well, thank you for having us. Uh, one of the basic principles of public health is that you cannot look only at one disease. You have to look at public health very broadly. And um, the strategy we have used for COVID-19 has not been good, been good for COVID-19, but it's also generated enormous collateral damage on other public health. Uh, less uh, plummeting uh, vaccination rates, less cancer screening, worse outcomes from cardiovascular diseases and mental health problems and so on. So we think it's important to uh, present an alternative way to uh, approach uh, COVID-19. And this is nothing uh, revolutionary because this is things that people have been saying since the very beginning uh, back in March, but it's often been dismissed. So we were thinking coming together, three uh, scientists from reasonably respectable universities to sign a declaration urging the world to look into a different approach uh, might have a good effect. So where we uh, protect, do a better job protecting older people and other high risk groups while we let children and younger people, younger adults, uh, live their lives normally going to in person schools and universities, etc. Okay, so if uh, Sunetra, you've got on a plane, you've come all the way from. Oxford, where you are professor there. Um, why did you want to take part? Um, and what is this alternative proposal that you're making? Our intention of, of putting on the table an alternative strategy for dealing with the current crisis, which protects the vulnerable, but at the same time allows us to minimize the damage done, particularly to the young and the disadvantaged sectors of our population. And that strategy essentially consists of shielding the vulnerable or investing quite seriously in finding ways to protect the vulnerable, those in care homes, obviously, and stopping infections in hospitals, but also uh, more generally in the community. We think we can do that while allowing those who are not vulnerable to this um, disease um, to, to go out there and get infected and build up what we call and will continue to call herd immunity, which is a level of immunity in the population that reduces the risk for everybody, which of course is consequential, particularly for those who are vulnerable. So this is what we, many of us quite independently um, have come up with or, or have been thinking in various different ways. We've Mm. Using different approaches, we, we've arrived at fairly similar conclusions, uh, but this has not been given a wide um, reception. Mm. Uh, in fact, we've met with resistance. So I was extremely um, pleased and honoured when Martin suggested that we might all um, meet here, uh, the three of us, and, and uh, put together something along the same lines uh, for, I suppose, a slightly different constituency. So, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, then, if Dr. Gupta just mentioned herd immunity, you know, she came right out with it. Uh, that's the phrase that um, people are very anxious to avoid using. I mean, even the Swedes um, say that that's not their strategy, that just is a possible byproduct. Are you advocating a herd immunity strategy? So, uh, herd immunity is not a strategy. Herd immunity is a fact about most infectious diseases, the, the, the course that they sp spread through the population. 
even if we were to have a, an effective vaccine, we would be relying on herd immunity as the endpoint of this infectious, infectious disease epidemic. So it's not, a, a, it's not, it's less of a strategy than a, a recognition of a biological fact. Uh, our aim is not to, to say we should just let do nothing. In fact, that's, I think, the misconception that people have when they hear the words herd immunity strategy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, what, what, uh, as, as both, both uh, Dr. Kuldorf and Dr. Gupta have, have emphasized, uh, our strategy involves protecting the, the vulnerable. Now, how do we know about that? We've learned a lot about this disease in the, in the six, not this eight months that, that we've, we've had to live with it. Um, the, and for, in particular, we've learned what groups are most vulnerable should they become infected for mortality and, and other, other severe bad outcomes. Um, we also learned about groups that are relatively well protected, even should, even should they become infected. Children, for instance, uh, in the United States, more children have died this year from the seasonal flu than have died from COVID-19. Um, children, and thank God, are, are relatively protected from COVID-19 infection should they become infected than, than a, an older adult, 65 or 70 or higher, who really are in a vulnerable position. Our strategy takes advantage of that extra, extra that knowledge we gained about this, and proposes concrete ways of addressing uh, the needs of the vulnerable, so that they don't become infected, so they don't die from the disease. Mm. While at the same time, the people who uh, who are suffering from the collateral damage of the lockdown, closed schools, closed businesses, closed universities, depression, uh, suicidal su suicidal ideation. All that enormous collateral damage, uh, 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 when they face very little risk from death from the disease, that has to end. Mm. So uh, the, the, the premise is not to do something reckless. The premise is to take account, as, as Dr. Kuldorf said, of, of all of public health, all of the harms. We care about, uh, we care about cancer. We care about uh, mental illness. We care about... Uh, all these things, we are not simply just bags of germs infecting one another, we're hu human beings. And we, we wanna uh, take advantage of the new knowledge we've gained, protect the vulnerable, and let people face the, the risk of the disease who don't actually face a, a very large risk of mortality if they were to be infected. So the, I guess the million dollar question is, is how, because um, even if you are accept that people who are in less vulnerable groups should be allowed to go and get infected, or that it may not be dangerous if they do, and I know some people will even have difficulties with that idea, um, the presumption has been that there is no practical way to shield vulnerable groups whilst allowing the rest of society to get it. You, you, you've called in your declaration, you call it focused protection. Um, and so far, no one seems to have really spelt out how that could work. Well, first of all, the key thing is that uh, whatever strategy we use, we're going to reach herd immunity. So if we do nothing, then we're going to have some old and some young people getting infected and we'll have a lot of death. If we protect everybody equally, then we can have some, eventually it will take longer time, we're sort of stretching it out, but eventually we can have some old people and some young people getting infected, so we'll have many deaths. But if we do uh, a targeted strategy uh, that protects the elderly and other high-risk groups uh, while letting younger people live normal lives, then among those who get infected before we reach herd immunity will be fewer old people and more young people and therefore be fewer deaths. And there are various uh, ways to do this. Uh, one is in nursing homes where we need to uh, uh, use staff that are either already have immunity or that we do frequent testing much more frequent than we do now of both the staff and the visitor, as well as we have less turnover among the staff. Uh, for, for older people in the uh, workforce, uh, 60 years old, they should work from home. So like an older teacher or an older professor, they could teach online or help other teachers in grading and so on. But there's no reason for a teacher uh, in her 30s or his 40s to work from home. And Dr. Kulov, as you're a Swede, how much of this is basically the Swedish model? Uh, so Sweden failed to protect the elderly in Stockholm at the beginning of the epidemic. So that was not a good thing. But Sweden has, as one of the few countries, uh, tried to uh, do an age target strategy. 
And we can actually see from anti antibodies data uh, that it has uh, worked. It not 100% because that's impossible. You cannot protect everybody 100%. But if we look at the antibodies comparing Spain and Sweden, in Spain, older people and working age adults, the level of antibodies is about the same in those two groups. Mm. In Sweden, uh, older people, they have only half the, the amount of the percentage uh, with antibodies among older people is just half compared to the working age people. So there has been some ability uh, in Sweden to uh, sort of differentiate uh, right. ages. And it can never be done 100%. And we can never eliminate the risk 100%. But uh, uh, if we want to minimize death in the long term rather than the short term, uh, an age target strategy would be uh, appropriate, both for COVID-19 as well as in terms of all the collateral damage that's being done. I mean, do you think we should be moving to this kind of regime immediately, no matter what we hear about a vaccine? Um, yes, I would agree that we should move towards this regime. Obviously, I hope uh, fervently that we do have a vaccine by spring uh, with which to offer further protection to the vulnerable sectors. But I uh, in any event, that we will be relying on a combination of vaccination and naturally acquired immunity to provide the level of protection we really want. The two other points I wanted to make was that this business of protecting the vulnerable in some ways is just a subset of total lockdown. And we've certainly endured total lockdown and implemented it. And, you know, we would some people would certainly say it was successful. So I think that one could view it in that um, sense as just a subset of what we've already done. And also just to remember that it would be a temporary measure. So I think a lot of the criticism uh, is kind of uh, predicated on it being a kind of permanent state of affairs. And of course, that's not what we're advocating. We're saying, let's just do this for the three months that it takes for the pathogen to sweep through the population Great enough herd immunity. So you think you think you think it would be that short a period needed before we could reach herd immunity? I mean, people who advocate on the other side of this will say that we don't know how long immunity lasts for. Um, it, we don't know if herd immunity would be achievable in that kind of time frame. Well, I think almost um, you know it's it's a sort of fundamental feature of a pathogen that has the kind of infectious period that this um, that. Um, SARS-CoV-2 has and um, the R0 that it has, that it should rise, peak and drop off within that period. I think uh, almost all mathematical modelers would agree to that. And, and indeed, that is what we've observed in many countries where it has kind of ripped through. So, I mean, I would be confident in, in saying that if we let, if we adopted this strategy, then uh, maybe we could all have a very nice, normal Christmas. Dr. Bertikara, can I ask you, how does this interplay with, with politics? I mean, your studies you've been involved with at Stanford have been highly politicized and controversial. Um, this is now, we are literally in the middle of a presidential election and the president is in hospital with the disease. You know, this has now become high politics. Uh, are, are you not worried that the three of you, by putting yourself forward like this, are essentially becoming pawns in a political campaign. I'm pretty sure that the president's strategy isn't the strategy that we're arguing for. Uh, it's not. In fact, the United States has followed a strategy similar to the UK and many other countries of, uh, you know, I'd say a, a more or less complete uh, attempted a more or less complete lockdown, uh, ignoring the age targeted uh, approach that we're we're we're, we're advocating. Um, so, I mean, I think. It's inevitable, and actually, I think to be something to be regretted that scientific, uh, you know, attempts at scientific knowledge, acquiring that knowledge, would become politicized. But I think, in the context of, of a epidemic that has touched every human on on the face of the earth, it, it's inevitable that it'll be political. Um, but we're we're. I mean, I I don't I don't actually know the politics of my colleagues. I, I I'm pretty sure that if they if we did. We probably disagree. Uh, what, what's striking to me is that despite this diverse background, uh, we've come to an agreement about what the science is telling us. This is a science-based approach, and it's aimed at minimizing the harm to to, to the population at large 
Um, and I think that's the, that's the message we want to send. Uh, it's something that we could get behind. Everyone can get behind because it's it it is the way to uh, reduce the harm to the vulnerable and reduce the harm to the uh, to the to the to the uh, to the younger population who are less vulnerable. This is a worldwide issue, and uh, we view it as a, a worldwide pandemic that has to be dealt with uh, uh, with the world, the whole world in our mindset. So there will always be some election somewhere in the world. And as public health scientists, it's our obligation to uh, propose what is the best strategy, what we think is the best strategy, irrespective of political considerations. Uh, you have to have trust, the population have to have trust in the public health uh, scientists and the public health proposals. And if we say that we are in favor of this politician or against that politician, then we're automatically going to sort of dismiss half the population and they won't listen to us. So in a crisis like this, a public health crisis, it's important that we express the message of uh, of what is best in terms of public health without political considerations. And then polit the politicians can have to deal with uh, how they want to do things. We live in this beautiful world together. Uh, and we also ch share the viruses together, and we want to protect uh, all everybody in the population, irrespective of their political opinions. So, t this focused protection. Um, if I have a grandmother who I live with, and I'm a school age child, what happens? Am I out there in the herd getting immunity, or am I protected? To pick up on something that Dr. Gupta said, which I think is incredibly important, um, the policy we currently have, which is to slow the spread of the disease, it extends the, the period when the grandmother and the, grand, and the granddaughter need to not be in contact with one another. That's already true. Uh, a, a, a focused protection plan that shortens that period, uh, you know, that, that, of, that, of that separation, that required separation, is, is more humane than, a, than the current strategy of essentially an extended lockdown, in effect, for a very long, an indefinite period of time. Right. So I think um, if you're thinking about the grandmother and the, grand, and, and the granddaughter, um, yes, the focus protection plan would require some level of, of, of separation, but that's not something we already have in the UK and the US and many other countries. Um, the issue is, what should the granddaughter do with her time? Does she go to school? Does she engage in normal activities, or does she sit at home uh, with the with the requisites with with the with the psychological harm that we've seen already in children and young adults and others coming from this extended isolation? Mm -hmm. This is the more humane policy. This reduces the amount of time that sort of isolation and separation needs to happen, and uh, and and it brings us to a, a state where we can actually resume normal life while the vulnerable can then start resuming activities because we've reached a state where they no longer face a threat from the young population. Do you, do you have any hope that, at least in the US, this approach might be adopted? I do, I do. I mean, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I, what I see is a scientific consensus among people who've looked at this very carefully. Now, of course, I understand there are people that disagree with us. But I think we can persuade them if, the, if they're looking at the same things we're looking at and thinking about the same models we're thinking about and thinking about the policy and the collateral damage in the way that we in the way that the evidence has become undeniable and hard to ignore. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, I believe that science works. It sometimes works slower than one hopes. Um, but I, I, but I, I am hopeful that we could persuade people uh, to listen to us. I mean, I think that, that in fact, I think that has one of, been one of the things I've regretted through this entire crisis is this uh, attempt to 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 suppress scientific discussion because some ideas are too dangerous to even discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think this idea is dangerous. And I think, quite frankly, I think if you ask me, it's dangerous to do what we're currently doing. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't want to suppress discussion. I want to have that discussion. And, I, and you know, if, if, if we learn something from people who disagree with me, I, I learn something from people who disagree with me, all the better. Right. I think that's that's I, I, I am hopeful, actually. I think we can persuade people because this is the right strategy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't suppose I'd be here if I weren't optimistic at uh, various levels. But at the very least, I hope that this um, engenders the debate that's been missing, I think, um, from this whole conversation. 
Dr. Gupta, are you worried about the political aspect? You've crossed the Atlantic to join this group. It's, um, you know, it's been hosted by a, a libertarian think tank. There will inevitably be the assumption of political atmosphere around it. Is that something that worries you? N no, it, it doesn't concern me in that um, I'm very secure in my own politics and uh, they don't align at all with any kind of libertarian thinking. Uh, but um, as Jay has, has so um, eloquently already expressed, this is completely outside. This All of this should stand above and outside of any of these political leanings. I mean, the very fact of it being conducted in a particular space that doesn't necessarily align, at least with my own politics, is almost a declaration of how fundamental and important this whole process is. Dr. Kuldorf, if the government suddenly switches to this new plan and says, OK, if you're old or vulnerable, you essentially find a way to shield and we'll help you do that. And if you're not, off you go. It doesn't matter if you become infected or not. Does it remain a voluntary scheme? So <laughs> if a parent is worried about long COVID or they're worried about effects on their child, uh, will they, you know, will they be able to opt out and say, well, actually, we don't like the idea of being part of this herd that's going to be immune. We, we want to try to avoid getting it. Uh, so the overall strategy is uh, uh, to protect the elderly while letting the young live their lives. But nobody should be forced to uh, do anything if, if a 25 year old person wants to uh, isolate themselves in a cabin up in the mountains for the next six months, they can do so. If parents want to do homeschooling of children, they can do so. Uh, so now we are forcing people to not engage uh, and we should let people uh, do so. But if they want to or not, that's up to them. So if, do you think that in the US, for example, where you know half the population is, at least half the population is very frightened of this, disease, uh, enough people would um, go along with it uh, to, to reach the levels of immunity you need. Um, Dr. Batakaria, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, do. I think, I think um, there is a split in the population. And uh, in, I mean, I've seen and have received numerous uh, messages from, from people in the general population, some of whom are very, very scared, and some of whom are, are, are uh, uh, you know, regretting the, the loss of, of, of their livelihood and, and, and other opportunities for their children, for themselves. Um, I think that, that giving freedom to both is actually very, very important for public health, right? I, I think public health should address the fear by giving accurate information, right? So I think in the U.S., for instance, uh, there's, a, uh, th th there's a perception that young people are actually at very high risk when they're, when in fact, scientifically, they're not. And actually, I've, on, the, on the flip uh, I've seen people who are older who think that there's not much risk when in fact there is. Mm. Uh, so I think accurate public health messaging about the, uh, the level of risk will help address that fear and, uh, and so that people are, will appropriately understand the risks. Uh, and then second, the, the focus protection idea expands freedom in the sense that uh, if, you, if you're not fearful and you are in a, a low risk group and you, uh, you accurately you know, know what the risks are, it allows you to re-engage. Um, and uh, e even for older people, you know, if if uh, if I if I'm a grandfather, uh, not yet, but someday, uh, if I uh, and and my grand my, my grandchildren might come to me, uh, I I can say, okay, I might be at risk for a little bit from them, but I'm going to hug them anyways. Right? I think that that freedom is really important, but it's it's a, it's an informed freedom, as opposed to this perception perception that everyone faces the equal risk, which is not true. From the from the disease. So I think one key thing to to uh, think about here is that what we're doing right now with the lockdown is we are protecting low risk college students and low risk professionals who can work from home. At the same time, older working class people have to work uh, because they have to make a living or they work as a bus driver or in a supermarket and so on. So with the current approach, we are protecting. Uh, low risk people in the privileged class uh, while we are putting the burden of generating immunity that will eventually protect all of us. That burden is put on the working class and especially on the urban working class. What happens to your bus driver in, in your scheme? 
Well, if the bus driver is above 60 years old, they should not work. And one way to do that is to say that they can take a sabbatical for three months or six months, and they could use in the US social security or a pension plan in UK and other countries, where they can take a sabbatical while we wait for uh, herd immunity to be to be arrived, at which time they can then go back to work. I mean, I think there are creative ways that you can use the, the welfare schemes that we have in, in our respective countries to, to allow this to happen. We, instead, what we've done is we have uh, said, everyone take a sabbatical. You know, everyone, and, and of course not if you're an essential worker, if you're, if you're poor, you still have to work. So everyone, everyone rich, take a sabbatical. Everyone poor, you, you pay, for the, you pay for, uh, for the cost of this disease mitigation by you taking the risk. Uh, I think that this is a, a strategy that in, in, in many ways uh, promotes equality, uh, whereas the current strategy promotes inequality. Mm. Um, and, and I think that, that that also is a message that's worth worth emphasizing. Is, the, is this almost a more traditional epidemic response that you're proposing? Is there any sense in which this is what you would have expected us to do? It is. Uh, this is basic uh, public health 101. We're in this extraordinary situation. The whole swathes of the world has basically been put on pause for six months now. And we've got to the point where um, scientists such as yourselves need to kind of gather for uh, secret meetings in, uh, in houses in, in Massachusetts uh, to kind of come out with declarations of dissent uh, against this new orthodoxy. How do you think we got here? It is quite a mystery to me. I never thought uh, we would get here. Um, I remember in, in mid-March, one of my daughters saying, no, we're going to go into lockdown. And I said, no, that just simply can't happen. The image in my head then was of what lockdown would do. I was thinking, you know, what's going to happen to the person living in the slum in Mumbai? What's going to happen to the person in the township in Cape Town? Um, I just, uh, those were just thoughts, maybe, you know, quite emotional in some senses, um, uh, uh, by way of a response, uh, rather than scientific, that just made me think this could never happen. Um, then when it did happen, of course, I had to take a step back and start to look at the situation scientifically. And um, I think the two kind of meet here in this declaration. The science and the, the morality point in the same direction, uh, mm -hmm. as, does the, as, as does standard public health practice. And we're just calling to, to return to all, all of those things. Our response to this has been very myopic, I suppose, I mean, or, or blinkered. Or, we've been looking down a single axis on this. And that's been my problem right from the outset, is that we, we surely right from the outset should have started thinking about all the damage that could be done and would be done if we simply went about um, with, you know, following this single goal of getting rid of or suppressing this virus. We've become obsessed with one one metric, perhaps. One metric, one kind of message, one kind of goal, and the language that surrounds it is very sort of bellicose and uh, and very directed at the achievement of that goal. And somehow it's sucked everyone in, and it's created this space, a safe a space from which one can, you know, virtue signal madly. If this only gets people to sit up and look around and say oh my God, 130 million people are going to starve to death as a result of this. Just that one thought I'd like people to keep in their heads. Dr. Kildoff? While everybody can get infected, and uh, many will get infected, uh, the risk of mortality, the risk of death is very, very different uh, um, across the ages. And it's not like it's twice as high risk. It's not that it's five times high risk. It's not that it's 10 times. It's not that it's hundred times. The difference risk between the oldest and the youngest is more than thousandfold in terms of mortality. So while everybody can get the disease, everybody can, uh, everybody can get infected, the risk of mortality is very, very different between the oldest and the youngest, and there's more than thousandfold difference in the risk. And that is, in a sense, a weakness of the pandemic. And if you have an enemy, which this pandemic is, we have to utilize that weakness to minimize the death and to minimize the collateral damage to our society and to 
everyone. But there's one data point I can bring forward to show how poorly we reacted to the virus uh, and, and, and how we violated standard public health thinking. Uh, we have we are now at a point where we think about people who get the virus as as if they're at fault. We've stigmatized people who have the disease. I, I mean, I'd hope we'd learned our lesson from the HIV epidemic to not do that. And yet the public health messaging has, I, I think, has effectively reinforced that. Um, we have to change that. And, and a, a focused protection plan like we're talking about will help change that. It'll, it'll, it's the, 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 the responsibility to limit the damage is a communal responsibility, not simply an individual one. And the messaging has been an individual, if you do this, you do that, you're a good person, you're, 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 you're slowing the spread. I think that's a mistake from public, public health. It's not taking advantage of the weakness the virus actually has. Mm. This is the saner approach, the more moral approach, the more scientifically based approach. I have to ask, since we, we mentioned it at the start, the president is in hospital. Um, how much do you think how this plays out for him in the next few days could actually dictate the overall response to the virus? I mean, if he shrugs it off easily and is back to full health by Tuesday, do you think your plan has a higher chance of being listened to? I guess this incident kind of highlights how we've been focused on individual fates in in trying in our perception of what's actually happening. Whereas what we really need to do is think of this at, at a more at, at the level of the community and not, I mean, obviously, Trump is ill, something will happen to him. And we all, as individuals, want him to get better. Mm. But, you know, it's it should not affect how we think of controlling this pandemic. Uh, doctors Kuldorf, Gupta and Batikaria, thank you so much for telling us about that. We will print your declaration underneath this video and everyone can have a chance to read it and get involved in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much. It will be very interesting to see how this is received. Um, thank you to Dr. Martin Kuldorf, Dr. Sunetra Gupta and Dr. Jay Batikaria uh, for joining us and talking us through the uh, declaration which they have now signed, which calls for a different approach to COVID-19 policy and a move away from blanket restrictions. We will see who listens, but you've heard it here. It was Lockdown TV from Unheard. Thanks for joining.